Hello and welcome to GameTag. The Taito Egret Mini 2 is now available or will soon be in your area, so I figured we could check it out. Now, they sent this to me and it comes with some caveats. I can't show the box, I can't show the underside of the unit, and I can't show the underside of the controllers. Supposedly, the reason is that the labels aren't quite correct yet. They look fine to me, but what do I know? Anyway, with that in mind, let's check out this unit. Here it is. The Taito Egret 2 Mini. There's three editions available, and I got the one with the blue joystick and buttons. It comes with an HDMI cable and a USB cable for power, but no power adapter. And be careful what power adapter you use, because some games and peripherals may ask for more power than it can supply, and the unit will shut off. Now you may be asking, just what in the blazing hell is an Egret? Well, it's what Taito calls their candy cabs in Japan, just like Sega calls theirs Astro City. Speaking of which, this unit is quite a bit larger than Sega's Astro City Mini, and so is the screen, clocking in at 5 inches. That's right, 5 inches is huge. The joystick is micro-switched, as are the 6 main buttons, and they all feel really nice. There's more travel in the joystick than there is in the Astro City Mini, but I really like it. Up top, you can slap on a cool piece of plastic and slide some artwork in there, but I didn't get anything to put inside. There are also two stereo speakers, which is cool. The sound quality of the built-in speakers is a bit tinny, mostly treble with a tiny bit of mid-range and no bass whatsoever. On the back side, you have a power switch, two USB ports for external controllers, an HDMI jack which outputs 720p video, a headphone jack, and a USB Type-C for power. On the right side is an SD card slot. Here, you can plug in extra games like those that come with a special trackball slash paddle controller. The card's format is unreadable by my computer. Underneath the unit is a switch that allows you to select between four and eight-way joystick controls. I really wish I could show you the underside of the unit. Not sure why I can't, it's not like there's a built-in flashlight or something. Oh, and the entire screen just happens to pop out and rotate to support games in <gasps> Seriously, how cool is this? This is an awesome feature. The Astro City Mini should have done this instead of releasing two separate units. The quality of the screen itself is quite nice, especially on its brightest setting. You can rotate the screen at any time on any game and it'll automatically adjust to fit, kind of like your phone. Before you launch each game, you'll get a little bit of information about it. The button layout, the position you'll want the 4 or 8 way switch in, as well as some adjustable options specific to that game. You can also begin a new game or continue from a save slot if you made one earlier. Speaking of the save slots, you have three of them and they work just like you'd expect. Pause the game, pick save, and choose a slot. You can load it from anywhere in the game and it all works very fast. As far as the options for the main unit go, the volume adjusts the level of the built-in speakers, but not the HDMI output. You have to quit the game and exit to the menu to adjust the volume. The default quality of the HDMI video is like this, soft with artwork surrounding it. If you turn HDMI wide on, it scales the image vertically and the borders are gray. Sadly, there are no options for perfectly black borders. That kinda sucks. You can turn the wallpaper on and off just as long as the HDMI wide is set to off. The HDMI turn allows you to play games in tape mode by turning your TV 90 degrees. The position of the screen on the unit itself won't affect this. Filter is the blur setting. This is backwards. If you want sharper pixels, you have to turn it on. HDMI wide set to off and filter set to on is the closest thing you're going to get to having an integer scaled image and some games will have shimmering in the scrolling. If you set HDMI wide to on, then the horizontal shimmering may go away, but you'll get vertical shimmering. Either way, you're going to have a little bit of shimmering. That is, unless you set the filter to off. I've also noticed that the HDMI video can sometimes appear a bit dim or washed out. It's not full range according to my scopes, which is unfortunate. The darkest black should hit zero, and the brightest white should hit 100. The BGM settings allow you to choose from three different background tracks for the menu, with no option to turn it off. Demo settings allow you to adjust how much time the unit sits there before playing game demos. Language settings allow you to pick from a few different languages. Legal notices are, well, a bunch of legal notices and boring stuff like that. Staff credits are exactly that if you're curious who's behind everything here. And you can reset everything to default if you want. Playing the unit, the built-in joystick and buttons feel pretty good. They're small, so it does feel a bit less accurate than a real arcade, of course, but overall, they're good. 
The optional controller works, but it honestly doesn't feel very nice. In fact, the D-pad is crap. Fortunately, many other USB controllers work just fine, like the Sega Astro City Mini Control Pad. But using this, you'll still need to hit the button on the unit itself to bring up the menu. The special trackball slash paddle controller is interesting. The trackball works well, even though it's pretty small. Unfortunately, the paddle has given me issues. At first, it barely even worked, and then it stopped working altogether. Even in MAME, the trackball would work, but the paddle wouldn't. Then suddenly, it started working perfectly fine for no reason. So I do question the reliability of this particular controller. I really like it though, when it works. Once when I was playing the Egret 2, it crashed on me and then asked me to shut it down, but so far this has only happened once. Other than those glaring factors, this is a pretty cool tabletop device. Okay, now is the part where we take a look at all 40 games that are built into this thing. Lots of good stuff, plenty of mediocre stuff, and a few bad ones. And we're going to be doing it alphabetically. Let's do this. First up is Adventure Canoe from 1982. Here you ride a canoe and you need to avoid obstacles. Naturally, your canoe can shoot animals on the land who are just minding their own business. You can also shoot humans, but those guys are tossing arrows at you. It's tough, but more fun than it looks. Next is Bubble Bobble from 1986. Taito loves their single screen games, and this one has you transformed into a monster who shoots bubbles to trap enemies. Pop the bubbles once they have bad guys to clear the screen and move on to the next one. Not bad, but it's something that doesn't hold my attention for very long. Bubble Memories, the story of Bubble Bobble 3 came out in 1995. This is basically the first game with new graphics and sound, though honestly, I don't think that the music is very good in this one. Bubble Symphony was released in 1994. This is basically Bubble Bobble 2. I think the graphics and sound here are better than Bubble Memories. It plays mostly the same, though sometimes you can choose your path, which adds a bit of replayability. Otherwise, it's just more Bubble Bobble. Here's Kadash from 1989. This is a side-scrolling hack-and-slash RPG hybrid. Unfortunately, this is in Japanese despite my language settings. It doesn't matter much, though. Slice up your enemies and level up along the way. Be sure to buy better armor as well as life potions at the shop. The controls in this one aren't the greatest, but the game is still unique. The bounce back when you get hit frustrates me, and it happens often, but otherwise it's pretty fun. Chack and Pop is from 1983. You need to rescue the hearts and exit the level while dropping bombs left or right. It moves more smoothly than the SG-1000 version, but it sucks just as bad. I really do hate it. Dunkuga is a one-on-one -on -one fighting game from 1994. It was a previously unreleased update to Kaiser Knuckle, which is also on here. I like this one a lot. Choose from 10 different characters. The control is just like Street Fighter 2 with six button attacks. Each of the environments are destructible, which reveals more of the stage on both sides. This definitely adds to the game, as I want to see both of the hidden sides on each stage. I haven't figured out many special moves yet, so it can be a bit tough, but overall I'm really enjoying this one, and I recommend that you try it. <laughs> Darius Gaiden is next, and it came out in 1994. This is the only Darius game on here, likely because it was the first single screen game in the series. No worries though, as it's definitely the best game in the franchise in my opinion. Shoot down a bunch of fishy enemies and then choose your path to the next stage. The music in the game is crazy and it really adds to the surreal experience. However, the sound did cut out briefly a few times on me in this one. Still, it's an excellent shooter that's totally worth your time. Don Doko Don was released in 1989. This is another one of those single screen games. Smash the enemies with your hammer and then toss them in order to clear the stage. I enjoyed this one quite a bit, but it gets tough pretty fast. It's definitely designed to eat your quarters. The original Elevator Action was released in 1983. You're a spy making your way down a building through a series of elevators and shooting people as you do it. I can't even imagine the maintenance budget of this building with all of these damn elevators. I've always felt that this game was kind of weak in my opinion. Elevator Action Returns, however, is completely awesome. This 1994 game starts out in the same way as the original, just with about 300 times the awesome, 
but soon you'll be wandering horizontally through the stages as well. You can get a bunch of different weapons and you can even jump kick. The graphics are super nice with lots of scaling and explosions. Even the sound is fantastic. I can't recommend this one enough. One of the standout titles on this system for sure. The Fairyland Story was released in 1983. This is another one of those single screen games. Attack your enemy to turn them into a cupcake and then keep pressing attack to banish the cupcake out of existence to clear the stage. It's pretty basic and honestly didn't interest me very much. Gun Frontier came out in 1990. This is a shooter where your plane kind of looks like a gun. That's as good as it gets though, as the game itself is mediocre at best. It's really tough to see some of the enemy bullets. I mean, damn, look at that. The bombs look cool when you use them though. Halley's Comet is a shooter from 1986. You're trying to save Earth from a bunch of comets. It plays well enough, even though it's obviously pretty plain. I like it more than Gun Frontier anyway. Hat Trick Hero is a soccer game from 1990. I thought hat trick was a hockey term, but I really know nothing about sports. Please, be sure to leave your comment below explaining what a hat trick is. I'm sure you'll be the first. Anyway, I like the presentation here with lots of scaling and general craziness. It doesn't play super smoothly, but honestly, it's not too bad. I've certainly played worse soccer games. Kaiser Knuckle, also known as Global Champion, is a 1994 game. This is the slightly unpolished version of Dunkuga that I talked about before. This one actually got released. Everything I said about that one can be applied here. It's still good though, just not hugely different. Kiki Kai Kai is next and it's from 1986. This is an overhead run and gun where you can shoot and also have a slash type melee attack. Some of you might know this series better from its sequel on the Super Nintendo called Pocky and Rocky. This one's more primitive for sure, but it still provides a fun and solid experience that you should try. Here's Kikakugo Tiger, also known as Twin Cobra. This is a satisfying vertical shooter from Toa Plan that can get pretty hectic at times. Still, it's very rewarding to blow things up, especially stuff on the ground. Most Toa Plan games are like that. This one has some good weapons to collect as well. You really can't go wrong with this one unless you try to pronounce the Japanese name like I did. The Legend of Kage is from 1985. You control a ninja who jumps all over the place trying to rescue the kidnapped princess. The gameplay is okay, but it's the music that always attracted me to this one in the arcade. You can throw stars and slash with your katana. You jump by pressing up, which you'll absolutely love if you happen to be European. Still, I like it for what it is, even if there aren't any continues. This game is partially censored. Maybe there used to be some digital nudity? Lunar Rescue was released in 1979. This one starts out kind of like Lunar Lander where you navigate your lander through the meteors and land on a pad to rescue a person. Then you fly back to your ship while shooting down aliens who are truly very, very evil. After that, you dock with the ship. This one's a lot of fun actually, and I suggest you give it a go. Lupin the Third is from 1980 and I wish it had stayed there. You control Lupin trying to get the money bags. The only button in the game makes you disappear and materialize elsewhere in the level. The problem is that I can't seem to grab any of these money bags at all. I've got to be missing something. F this game. Metal Black was released in 1991. According to the game's intro, this is the sequel to Gun Frontier. This one is a horizontal shooter, however, and it's a much better game. Collect tons of power-ups to build up your weapons and also to release a beam sometimes when your gauge allows it. This one has some nice graphics, but can be a little chaotic. It's worth a try though. Mizubaku Adventure, also known as Liquid Kids, was released in 1990. This one is built around similar concepts as Taito's single screen games, but instead it's a scrolling adventure. Toss gobs of water to trap enemies and then destroy them. Hold the button for a bigger charge. This is an excellent game and much better than most of the company's single screen games, at least in my opinion. This is another standout title on the system for sure. The New Zealand Story is a 1988 game. As I think I've said before, this game is all you need to know about New Zealand and its history. You play as a yellow kiwi who's on a mission to rescue the other kiwis. You can shoot, jump, and float if you have a special item. I hated the Mega Drive version of this game, but fortunately this one is much better. It's still not a favorite though. 
The Ninja Kids is a 1990 beat-em-up. You control a marionette in this game, which kind of reminds me of Ninja Combat on the Neo Geo. You chop other marionettes to pieces, and overall it's kind of fun. I like seeing all of the kooky character designs, like this guy who I sliced up until he deflated. I think this is one that's worth playing through for sure. Alright, 15 more games to go. Well, actually 25, but 15 more built-in ones. Outer Zone is from 1984. Maneuver your tank thing around the isometric track to destroy various things which are pointed out on the map. The control is quite weird in this one, and I wasn't really enjoying being alive as I played it. Pirate Pete is a cool 1982 game. You start out by swinging from rope to rope across the deck of a ship. Then you take to the sea and stab a bunch of sharks directly in the face. Then you run through some caves and oops, I died. I started out not liking this one very much, but soon grew to really appreciate it. This is another good title on here. Here's Puzzle Bobble 2X from 1995, also known as Bust a Move Again. Aim your thingy thing to shoot colored balls to match the same color to get them to disappear. Games like this don't really do much for me, but if you like them, it's here for you. Kix was released in 1981. Draw lines to fill a predetermined percentage of the screen while avoiding the sparks and the colorful line. It's pretty simple and not one that I ever gravitated to. Rai Mize is from 1988. Yeah, a 1988 take on Pac-Man. Collect the dots and go to the next level. Taito actually thought that arcade goers in 1988 would want this. At least there are boss fights, but otherwise there is not much here that's very exciting. Rainbow Islands is another 1988 game. This one is like Parasol Stars, but less good. Use rainbows to kill enemies and make it to the top of the level. I personally like the regular Bubble Bubble games more, but hey, maybe you'll enjoy it. This one is also partially censored. I bet I would have enjoyed it a lot more if it weren't. Here's Rastan Saga, which I usually just call Rastan. Some of you call it Rastan. I can't say Rastan, I have to say Rastan. Anyway, I own the arcade and it doesn't have this intro. Why'd they cut that out of the North American version? This is a good but tough hack and slash game where you play as a Conan the Barbarian wannabe. This is another Taito arcade game where the main thing that got my attention in the arcade was the music. I'm glad it made me try it out because it's super fun. Rayforce is a shooter from 1994. This is a fantastic game and by far my favorite in the Rayforce series. You may also know it as Galactic Attack on the Saturn outside of Japan. This game is pure 2D, not a polygon in sight unlike the sequels. And it's all the better for it, with fast and furious action and kind of relaxing music. You attack ground objects with one button and airborne objects with the other button. The music isn't quite as nice as the Saturn version, but that's okay. This is yet another standout title available here. Rune Arc is a beat-em-up from 1990. You might also know this one as Growl. You play as an animal rights activist who goes around and frees animals. Sometimes they even help you attack the bad guys. This is so much better than the low memory Genesis conversion. I'm always impressed by how many characters appear on screen at once. I'm super happy that this one is on here to play, though you'll have to settle for only two players instead of four. Scramble Formation was released in 1986. This is a rather unremarkable vertical shooter where you can grab red planes and change the formation. You keep going through clouds, and when you first go into them and when you come out of them, the game doesn't let you shoot. This happens quite a bit on the first stage. It didn't take long before I became bored and wish I had chosen another hobby. Space Invaders from 1978 is here. What can I say? It's Space Invaders. It would be kind of weird if it weren't on here, I suppose. Steel Worker is a 1980 game. I don't understand this one at all. There's a dude wandering around and also icons at the bottom of the screen, but I don't seem to be able to do anything at all no matter what I press. Surprised Taito thought this would be a good fit for the Egret 2 Mini. Here's Tatsujin from 1988, also known as Truxton. This one is a bit tougher than the home versions and it'll really give you a challenge if you turn up the difficulty. I've always enjoyed the music in this one. This game is very much a classic, though it might not be very accessible to shooter newbies. I still think you should try it though. Violence Fight is from 1989. 
This is a one-on-one -on -one fighter with stiff controls. They're also quite laggy and it doesn't help that the middle button is jump, right between punch and kick. I like the size of the characters, but I think this one would be more enjoyable if the attacks occurred when I pressed the button instead of a few weeks later. The last built-in game is Volfeed, though I think the logo looks like it says Volviev. For some reason, Taito thought we needed a 1989 update to Kix, and that's exactly what this is. You can get some cool temporary upgrades though. Still, I don't really care for it, especially the droning audio. Now let's take a look at the 10 games that come with a trackball paddle controller. Arkanoid was originally released in 1986. This game uses the paddle and it plays like Breakout. The paddle works well, but it takes some getting used to. For whatever reason, this game is partially censored. What the hell? Are some of the blocks shaped like dicks or something? Arkanoid Returns is a follow-up to Arkanoid as you may have guessed. This 1997 game plays the same, but with slightly better graphics and sound. This is actually the third game in the series to be released in the arcade. Arkanoid Revenge of Doe came out in 1987 and is the second game in the series. The presentation here is more on par with the first game and you're still using the paddle, of course. This one is also partially censored because when you think adult content, you think Arkanoid. Birdie King is a 1982 golf game. Use the trackball to swing at your ball. It takes a lot of getting used to and even once you do, it's still quite difficult to be very accurate. At most, this is a curiosity and nowhere near as good as Arnold Palmer Tournament Golf on the Sega Genesis. Camel Trite is a 1989 game that uses the paddle. What a weird name for a game. This one's called On the Ball on the Super NES outside of Japan. Anyway, you spin the maze and let gravity take its course. You make your way to the goal within the time limit. The paddle control on this one is super accurate and it will spin as fast as you spin the dial. I kind of like this one, though I think some people will find it boring. I just feel really connected to the maze with the dial. Marine Date is from 1981. Use the trackball to guide the octopus to his girlfriend. That's easier said than done, but it's fine once you get used to the controls. You have a limited number of shots to make your way to the bottom right corner of the screen where she is. You gotta plan your shots carefully. I made it up to level 7, can you get further? Try it, you just might like it. Plump Pop is a 1987 game, and it's partially censored. I mean, it's called Plump Pop after all, make up your own jokes. You bounce up to destroy all of the UFOs and it uses the paddle, controlling kind of like Arkanoid. The problem is that you can get bouncing so fast that it's almost impossible to figure out where you're gonna land quickly enough. This is okay, I guess. Poochie Carrot is next and it's from 1997. This paddle game is basically Arkanoid disguised as an anime puzzle game. The control is very good, but really, all you need to worry about is hitting the ball and not any of the gem colors and whatnot. I'm not sure what this one is trying to be, but it's not bad. Here's Strike Bowling from 1982. Use the trackball to aim and roll your ball towards the pins. It works better than you might think and it's actually kind of fun. I'm quite sure this was the best video bowling game back in 1982. Finally, we have Cyvalian from 1988. This strange game has you using the trackball to guide a rather large dragon around the stage. You can breathe fire, but once the gauge runs out, you'll need to wait for it to refill. There are even boss fights at the end. I really enjoyed this one for the most part. The only thing I don't care for is the stuttery scrolling as I spin the ball. It's gotta be kind of annoying for you viewers to watch since you're not the one spinning the ball. Otherwise, I like the high-res visuals and it's fun, even though it's rather weird. There you go, that's the Taito Egret Mini 2. Overall, I think it's pretty cool, though I do wish it supported 1080p and had a few more scaling options with a little bit better video quality. Now on its own, playing on its own screen, it's much cooler, obviously. And I do dig that special controller. Anyway, what do you think of the Egret Mini 2? It's kind of a weird name. Let me know, and in the meantime, thank you for watching GameSack.
finally. My bootleg edition of the Volfeed soundtrack showed up. Let's give it a listen. Those chaps at Taito are musical geniuses. I love it when I can't tell if I'm listening to video game music or maybe I should get out of my house and evacuate the city. Nice! Taito! <laughs> <laughs> 